It's been a pleasure to be here, be here again. I was um, at the Haven Centre in, in 1999, so I, I'm very pleased to have been invited back. Um, he's just talking about Karl Mannheim reminded me that um, uh, Karl Mannheim was originally Hungarian and um, after the First World War um, there was a very brief socialist republic in, in Hungary and in fact he, he was um, made head of a teacher training, teacher education institute um, under, the, uh, under the socialist government but then had to uh, flee um, to Germany in 1919 um, when there was a, a military um, a coup uh, which overthrew the, the socialist government. Um, so he had, he had a, a, a long background in, in teacher education and educational issues. Um, as Michael says, I have been interested in the last few years particularly in uh, issues of, of privatisation or privatisations um, of education um, and I've been pursuing that in a number of ways doing empirical work trying to understand how that occurs who's involved what its effects are in various ways and more recently I've become interested also in how ideas about privatization and other related notions move around um, and the work I've been doing uh, recently is, is trying to understand look at make sense of, of those movements, or uh, borrowing from social geography, what we might call policy mobilities. So today and tomorrow I'm going to talk about some aspects of policy mobilities, particularly education policy and particularly um, aspects of, of privatization. Um, and they're companion pieces, the two lectures. Um, today I'm going to concentrate mainly on, on business, uh, and business in the sense of both um, the, the, the message in terms of, of business as a form of, of privatizing education, but also as the medium. Uh, business as a means of moving policy ideas around. Um, and tomorrow I'm going to talk more about issues of advocacy and, and philanthropy. Um, but these things are very tightly intertwined, so that the separation out is, is very heuristic and, uh, and in a way uh, you can only get a sense of the whole picture by, by putting the two aspects together and the two lectures together. Um, I'm going to be using some, some strange vocabulary uh, as we go along uh, because in order to, to understand business you must come to grips at least to some extent with, with the language of business. Um, and not leave that enterprise solely to economists and, and business studies specialists. Um, it's important that as sociologists, political scientists, social geographers, that we also interrogate uh, and make sense of business practices. So I, as we go along, I'm going to be using some, some terminology that's normally deployed within economics and business. And finally, by way of introduction, um, this enterprise is set within uh, a broader context of, of making sense of, of neoliberalism and, and how neoliberalism moves. Um, but I, I'm very always now trepidatious about the term neoliberalism because it, it's used so broadly and so loosely that to some extent it, it, can, it can be quite meaningless. Um, and I, I have a particular sense in which I, I use and understand neoliberalism, which I'll be happy to talk about a little more if you want me to. Um, but I'm going to use, use that term, uh, but use it, use it with some, some care. And what I, what I want to do is I want to get inside <coughs> neoliberalism. Most of the writing about neoliberalism is pretty abstract. Um, it, it, it's theoretical or, or it's, it's entirely general uh, in terms of talking about what li neoliberalism is and what it does. Um, I, I want to think about some examples of how neoliberalism is done. I want to think about some of the spaces and the practices within which neoliberalism is done. And I want to think about, as I said, how it moves around and how those spaces 
are joined up and some of the actors and organizations and subjects and techniques that are involved in facilitating and enabling that movement. And I'm going to talk about that even more in the lecture tomorrow. And this is a, a, a supranational project. Um, that there's an, an immense geographical and scalar, scalar diversity uh, involved in making sense of these movements. <coughs> and I realize to some extent there's a sort of paradox. This is a, a very ap appropriate moment to be talking about neoliberalism in Wisconsin, in Madison at this moment in time. Um, but on the other side, in an inappropriate sense, I'm going to be talking about it in a, in a global sense where you're experiencing it um, in a very immediate sense in terms of um, inside and outside your front door. Um, but I hope some of these things will also have some local relevance. So Wendy Lana, who's um, a writer on neoliberalism, I, I like very much. She, she says, we need a more careful tracing of the intellectual policy and practitioner networks that underpin the global expansion of neoliberal ideas and their subsequent manifestation <coughs> in government policies and programs. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take up her challenge in understanding and tracing the movement and instantiation of neoliberal ideas. And I'm going to do this mainly through examples and talk around some examples and then draw some general conclusions uh, based on those examples. And I just wanted to say that, um, um, as I indicated already, I, I, I started this by looking at, at privatization within my own nation state. So in, in, in 2007, I wrote a book called Education PLC uh, in the UK, that's public limited company. Education Incorporated would be a, a kind of American translation. Um, and there's also some, some very interesting US work which looks at what's happening in terms of privatization in the US. Um, a very good book by Trisha Birch, who used to be here now at uh, USC. Um, uh, an interesting new book by Jill Koyama, who's at, at Buffalo, um, uh, <coughs> looking at No Child Left Behind. Um, some work by Ken Saltman, some of which does branch out into areas of, of uh, international dimensions of, of privatization. Um, and I came across a, an interesting, although very, very wide-ranging, article recently by, by Joel Spring that was published in uh, uh, the AERA Research Journal. But for the most part, we, we don't have much work that looks at a, on a global scale and looks across or outside uh, of national contexts. So this is what I want to try and uh, explore, and I'm talking about work that I'm still doing and still thinking about. So as I said already, I want to look at some new ways in which neoliberal policies and ideas move. And in particular, to do this, I want to look at business in policy and policy as business. And I'll explain this more what I mean by that in a moment. Um, but particularly, I'm thinking here about the buying and selling of policy and policy ideas. Policy ideas are now not just political possibilities, they're actually commodities. They're actually bought and sold in the global marketplace, and I'll give you some examples of that. I'm also going to talk about some of the dynamics of education business, edu businesses. Um, I'm going to look at things like, and this is where some of the language begins to creep in from economics, acquisitions and mergers, and the creation of new multinational education businesses. And then at the end, I want to say some things very, probably very briefly, about the relationships of business, education businesses, to the idea of the nation state and changing modalities uh, and forms uh, of the nation state and the emergence of something that we might call oxymoronically uh, a neoliberal state. But I'm going to be doing this by, by telling some neoliberal stories and giving you some examples of, of neoliberal practice. Um, and the one thing I will say about the sense in which I, I'm, I'm using neoliberalism is that I want to, I want to encompass within it um, both an economic and structural 
sense of neoliberalism, um, as well as a, a discursive and governmental sense of neoliberalism. So, as Michael would put it, I, I want to have post and neo in my um, in my conception of neoliberalism, and, and I, I want to attempt a, a balancing act um, that that enables me to, to deal with both of those aspects. In fact, I want, would want to argue that you can't actually sensibly make, um, make use of the idea of neoliberalism without both a structural and discursive uh, conception. Although when I say discursive, what I mean is practices and subjectivities. I'm not talking about language, as uh, some people often think about discourse. As I said, the two lectures are highly interrelated, and here I'm going to talk about some aspects of education business. And I'm going to look at, at three aspects of business, education business. I'm going to look at the export and selling of policy, and the development of a, a new group of knowledge companies, companies who sell knowledge, sell policy ideas. Then I want to say something about education as big business, which focuses on consolidations and mergers of companies to create transnational giants. And then finally, I want to say something about what I call selling students, which is actually the buying and selling of educational institutions, the bricks and mortar, um, and the students who, who work within them. And in all of this, The other thing I want to, to underline is that, that we are at a key stage, a, 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 a shift in terms of the nature of, of education businesses, uh, the movement to the multinational form. And at the moment we don't have a well-developed model or a map or a typology of these businesses and, and we need to try to begin to try and develop that and, and that's also what I'm trying to do. Um, but as I said also, in relation to these developments, you also have to incorporate ideas about social enterprise and philanthropy and advocacy, and I'll be talking about that a little more tomorrow. A familiar face just walked in the door. So I'm going to start with the idea of exporting and, and selling policy. And the point here, as I've said already, is that policy now, policy knowledge, policy ideas, in a variety of ways, are a profit opportunity. In traditional policy transfer literature, the notion is that there's a movement between uh, political advisors, consultants, and experts um, who facilitate the transfer of policy ideas from one country to another in some kind of abstract sense. But increasingly, this movement is actually on the basis of buying and selling. It's actually done by companies who seek to sell policy ideas um, across the globe. And I'll give you uh, a couple of examples. Um, this, is, this is one British-based company called the Matrix Knowledge Group. And this is their particular division called Matrix Evidence. And this is an invitation to a breakfast meeting um, to discuss uh, a new policy development. This was under New Labour. Uh, which was related to what was then called the New Opportunities White Paper, the government's agenda for capturing the jobs of the future, investing in families, communities, and citizens throughout their lives to help them get on and get ahead. And what Matrix wanted to do here was to put down a marker in terms of the role that they might play in providing an evidence base for this policy. So they saw new policy as a new opportunity uh, for profit, a new opportunity to sell evidence to government, to inform government to make policy, to make policy better. So in this sense, policy itself provides new opportunities for profit, and policy knowledge is also a profitable, profitable commodity which can be sold to governments. A second 
British based company. I should have said that Matrix also has offices in India. Um, A4E, another British company, has offices throughout Europe, uh, particularly does a lot of work in, in France and Germany. Uh, and A4E again is a, is a knowledge company. Uh, and here on their website, they are talking about the possibilities that they present to government in terms of new solutions to entrenched policy problems. Governments are looking for answers to difficult problems, multi-generational unemployment, youth unemployment, poverty, deprivation, poor health and low health, life expectancy, high crime and substance misuse. Those are the problems that A4E can solve. <laughs> We tackle the difficult problems and our innovative approaches deliver results. Not only that, and this is a recent version of their, their <coughs> website, they go on to say, difficult complex challenges that require long-term investment to solve, and yet the rise in social spending of the last decade cannot continue. Frontline public services must deliver more for less. So not only can they solve social problems that the state itself is unable to solve, but they can solve them more cheaply. So they're offering quality and efficiency. In a sense, underpinning this is a classic neoliberal trope, the idea that the state is inefficient and ineffective and cannot solve social problems and that the market can. And this is something we'll come back to at the moment. <coughs> Third example um, is more specifically related uh, to education, and this is a company called Cambridge Education, which I'll come back to uh, a number of times. Um, and Cambridge offer policy services and educational services um, to three audiences and at three scales. They operate in the, in the retail market of school services. So they provide school improvement services, they provide continuing professional development, teacher supply, um, various kinds of interim management and technical support to schools, which can be bought on a retail basis. They also advise and supply policy ideas to local and national government. And they also work uh, for government through contracts of various kinds. And one of the contracts that Cambridge Education has held, although it in fact has just lost it, um, it was one of the contractors for the English schools inspection system. So all English schools are inspected at regular intervals. The scheme is run by a government department or a non-governmental quasi-autonomous department called Ofsted, the Office of Standards and Education. But the work of inspection is contracted out to private providers. The work of inspection is actually done by private providers. There used to be seven such national contracts. There are now only three. In, in the reduction to three, Cambridge lost its contract. But it was one of the inspection contractors. And if you just hold that in your mind, we'll come back to that later. But then thirdly, uh, Cambridge also operate internationally and I'll look a little bit more at some of the things uh, that they do. So here we see for example 11 to 13th of October Bangkok three-day international conference exploring the link between external evaluation and school improvement. External evaluation read school inspection and again we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. In 2003, Merrill Lynch estimated that the global education services market, this is 2003, was $111 billion. It's probably grown enormously since then, and I would suggest that in terms of what they include in their, their measure, that it's a, also a massive uh, uh, underestimate. But even, even at that level, $111 billion, it's, it's no wonder that there's enormous interest in this international market in education services uh, among the private sector. Among other things, um, 
Cambridge Education has worked in over, over 70 different countries around the world. It's, it's now a global brand, Cambridge Education. Um, uh, among many of those examples, it's worked with the national government of Thailand, two provincial governments in China, education ministry in Hong Kong, so those are uh, on a national scale, but also in the United States, they, they've done work in California, they're involved in the reconstruction work in New Orleans after Hurricane Catriona, and the city of New York. And specifically in the city of New York, they are in the process of selling to New York the English inspections model. They have a six million dollar contract with the New York School District to introduce the English inspection system, which is called School Review uh, in New York, and to train the reviewers. So here's a very specific example of a national policy idea, school inspections, that's being sold around the globe in other locations. So this is this trade in policy ideas, in this case. Uh, inspections. They also work uh, very extensively across uh, uh, Asia uh, and Southeast Asia, uh, Papua New Guinea, Eritrea, Bangladesh, Cambodia, uh, the work for the Department for International Development, uh, European Community, World Bank, Asian Development Bank. They're also selling the English inspections model in Thailand to the Thailand government. They have a contract with the Thai government to introduce the English inspections model into Thailand. They have another contract to do the same thing in Beijing. So this is a market in policy ideas. Education quality, education improvement, um, and mechanisms of, of inspection uh, and review. They're also involved, Cambridge, in, in a role of a, a variety of other service activities in, in other settings, which includes, in relation to small states, a service which entails writing national policy documents. They will actually write your education policies for you. So, for example, in the case of the Maldives, they are actually have, they've been involved in drafting legislation for a new education act. And they're developing a sustainable financial framework for increased and equitable access to post-secondary education. So not only will they sell you policy, they will write policy for you. They would do dis bespoke policy writing. Although how bespoke it is in relation to the general ideas that they're operating with is a moot point. But again, this is a service that is for sale. The writing of policy documents, the provision of, of policy advice. And the other thing about Cambridge, which anticipates uh, the next set of issues I want to get onto, is that um, it was in fact a company created in the in the early 1990s, founded by two <coughs> ex-chief education officers, what you would call school superintendents. They created the company, but in 2004, it was bought by Mott McDonald. And Mott McDonald is an international engineering and management services company. It is a one billion global consultancy that has 12 core business areas. So education is one of their 12 core business areas, alongside others like transport, environment, communication, oil and gas, power, etc. So Cambridge Education is the education services division of Mott McDonald. I would say about McDonald that it, it's interesting in another sense in that it's actually an employee-owned company. So it's slightly different from, from many of the others. Um, 
it employs about 14,000 staff, as it says, and about one in seven um, are shareholders uh, in the company and participate in, in company decision making. So I want to go on to say something about the new configurations that these international education businesses uh, are taking um, and, and the new reach and scope of activities uh, in which they're involved. And some of these will be familiar to you, um, others won't. So I've already mentioned Cambridge and, and Mark MacDonald. I also wanted to mention Edison Schools UK. Edison Schools UK is the UK subsidiary of the Edison Corporation, uh, based in a small provincial town in England called Colchester. And recently, Edison Schools UK won a £1 million contract to take over the management of a North London comprehensive school, Salisbury School in Enfield, in North London. A three-year contract uh, to run the school on contract to the school district, to the local ed education authority. So here we have an American, uh, English subsidiary of an American company who's running uh, an English school. In fact, they've also now lost their contract, or in fact, it wasn't renewed after the three, three years. Um, they had a very fairly unimpressive track record in terms of the performance indicators written into their contract. Uh, and the school's going to be turned into an academy, uh, which is a, a new kind of, a, a somewhat inflated kind of charter school that we now have in the UK uh, system. Edison, the American uh, parent company, has also recently, 2007, um, committed itself to a global partnership with GEMS Education. GEMS is General Education Management Systems. It's a company based in Abu Dhabi, uh, run by a man called Sunny Varki. And GEMS also runs uh, private uh, medical facilities in the Middle East um, and in India uh, and it now also owns a chain of private schools in the UK. And the companies are getting together so that GEMS can use the Edison brand. As it says, says here, the alliance brings together GEMS Education, the largest operator of private schools in the Eastern Hemisphere, including the CGG in India, and New York-based Edison schools, largest managed public sector schools in the US and the UK. They manage one, that's a slight exaggeration. Um, under the alliance, GEMS will acquire licensing rights from Edison. This will include the issue of intellectual property, use of intellectual property, and the Edison name to manage public sector schools in the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. So here they see this, this partnership to be of mutual benefit, and this is a device for expansion, expansion into new markets. This is an opportunity for Edison to access new market opportunities uh, in places that it, it hasn't had access to before. So this is again one of the imperatives of business that is being played out in this particular uh, form, which is expansion and, as we'll see in a moment, also diversification. Growth through expansion and also growth through uh, acquisition, as in the case of um, uh, Mark McDonald uh, acquiring Cambridge Education. Let me give you an, another example. Um, I don't know how many of you know about Swedish free schools. Swedish free schools have become an interesting issue in the UK. The, in the run-up to the, to the last general election last year, the Conservative government, sorry, the Conservative Party, as they were then, the Conservative Party in opposition um, made numerous references to Swedish free schools as a model that the, the UK would do well to emulate. The free schools are independent schools, part of the state system, but run by other providers, in fact, mainly by 
for-profit company. So again, it's a kind of version of charter schools, but these schools are directly <coughs> equivalent to the municipal schools, the state, the public schools in Sweden. Um, but most of them are owned and run by private for-profit companies. And now about 17% of Swedish school students attend these schools. They're still in the state sector, but these schools are not run by new municipalities, they are run by private providers. A small, very small number of them are run by voluntary groups uh, or faith groups, but the majority by private providers. The largest of these companies is called John Bauer. It, it owns uh, around 27 of these schools. It also runs international schools in, in Spain, hotel and catering colleges in India and Norway, and has other ventures in China and Tanzania, and is involved in property development activities in Central America and Indochina. So it's already diverse, it's already global. But in 2009, John Bauer was bought by Denmark's largest private equity company, Axel, which has its other main interest in housing, fashion, and pet food. So Axel's portfolio is now housing, fashion, pet food, and education. And a Danish private equity company owns and runs 27 Swedish state schools. That's an interesting notion to think about, which we'll come back to. Just in passing, in 2010, another of the free school companies, Academia, Academia was bought by... EQT, another private equity company, who in a bidding war with Providence Equity Partners, a US private equity investor, was outbid or outbid by EQT. But in 2009, Providence Equity Partners bought Study Group, an Australian based global private education provider, for $570 million. And Study Group has 38 campuses and 55,000 students in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and the USA. So again, acquisitions and mergers and global expansion. And also here in particular, the interests of private equity in these areas. And the reason, the simple reason why I can, I, I can that. Academia Academia. 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 Got it. Academia. And John Bauer are attractive is because they are extremely profitable. <coughs> they're attractive to private equity because they're extremely profitable. Again, we have the situation of educational institutions in a diversity range of countries that are owned and run by non-national providers. So American private equity company running uh, campuses in, in the UK, Australia and, and New Zealand. But the Swedes are also interested in the English market. One of the <laughs> other main providers <laughs> is a company called Kunskapskolen. <laughs> Kunskapskolen are now sponsoring three English academies. These are schools inside the state system but run by independent sponsors. They're not for profit, but Kunskapskolen has made no bones about the fact that he's, it sees this move to sponsor three English academies as a foothold in the English education services market. So the movements here are in, in many directions. Denmark buying Sweden, America buying Sweden, Sweden wanting to get involved uh, in the, the English education market. Quickly, I want to two more of these because I, I want to make um, slightly different points from them. Another English company, educational service companies, 
is Nord Anglia. Um, in 2008, Nord Anglia fought off an attempt from another private equity company, Bearings Private Equity Asia, to buy them. Uh, the cash offer was at 450 pence a, a share, but they, they rejected that. So here we are, private equity, again, interested in education services. Nord Anglia is also involved in buying and selling aspects of its own business. So um, it recently sold one of its schools, Whole Grammar School, a private grammar school, um, for £4.18 million to the Church Schools Company, which is a charitable arm of the Church of England. Prior to that, it sold its nursery schools, of which at the time it was the largest single provider of nursery schools, private nursery schools in the UK, it, it sold them to an Australian company, ABC Learning. Uh, it sold its Leapfrog, Jigsaw and Petit Enfant brands for 31.2 million, although it did pay 73 million for them when it bought them in the first instance. They weren't making money, so it, it sold them off. So an Australian company became the largest single provider of private nursery schooling in the UK. Subsequently, in fact, ABC Learning has gone bankrupt. And the nursery schools are now in the hands of the, the administrator. We also have um, American companies who run nursery schools in the UK. Um, Brighter Horizons Family Solutions has a chain of nursery schools, as did, although it has now sold them, the world's largest nursery school company, Kindercare, which is a, a US company. Has over 2,000 nursery schools across um, the United States. Kindercare is owned by a private equity company called KKR. But Nord Anglia still does other things. It's, it's very active in the UK, but also particularly in the Middle East. It works in Qatar, in Bahrain, uh, in Saudi Arabia. In, in um, Abu Dubai, it um, runs on contract to the Abu Dubai Education Council 46 uh, elementary schools. And it also offers leadership development, pedagogical support and improvement, subject development, e-learning, and various curriculum development supports to individual schools uh, or to national, regional, uh, local governments. Again, enormous range, enormous diversity um, of activity. And Nord Anglia is also a major owner of international schools around the world, particularly uh, in China, uh, and again in the Middle East. Finally, last one of these examples, I want to come back to a, an English company uh, called Three E's. Three E's was actually a, a spin-off, a not-for-profit not spin-off company from um, a city technology college, which was a precursor of the academies to which I referred. And it, it runs a small uh, chain of, uh, of federation, rather in this case, uh, of schools, which includes some state schools and some private schools. In, um, in 2006, Three E's was acquired by English multinational management and professional services company, Faber Mansell, and they worked together on several uh, uh, education schemes. In 2009, Faber Mansell was integrated into ACOM, a US global professional services consultancy. And among its other contracts, in fact, its major contracts, ACOM's major, ACOM's major contracts, are working in Iran, Iraq to provide civilian support services to the US military. So here we have an um, English subsidiary, or in fact a, a service division of an American management consultancy company 
working with the US military in Iraq, which runs two UK public schools. Again, an interesting set of issues and relationships involved here. So what, what we see here are, are very typical, in fact, um, forms of, of business development um, and fairly typical forms of, of restless capital. Looking for new profit opportunities, looking for new horizons for profit, the commodification of the social, looking for uh, possibilities of expansion, uh, collaboration, diversification, acquisition, and merger. And we also see the key role in all of this of, of private equity investment, an indicator of the profitability of the sector. So all of this, education services, is now following the path of every other area of service and commodity activity. It's marked by the same economic and business processes, including forms of vertical and horizontal integration. And they are no better illustrated than in the case of Pearson. Um, Pearson has its largest market sector in, in the US, but it's actually a, a UK company, and it is the world's largest education company. Um, has a turnover um, of uh, well, its sales, worldwide sales in 2009, were 5.1 billion pounds, with a, a, a profit after tax of 710 million. This is a big business making big profits. And it has bucked the trend in terms of the recent financial crisis. While other companies have been suffering, Pearson has been expanding. And its profits have been growing uh, unchecked. In fact, they're, they're, that's speeding up. Uh, among other things, it owns the Financial Times in the UK, our equivalent to the Wall Street Journal. It owns Penguin Books and several other publishing houses. It owns Edexcel, which was at one time the University of London Examination Board, uh, runs examinations for schools around the world. It owns 50% of the FTSE index, which is the equivalent of the, uh, um, uh, I was going to say Nikkei. Well, it's the Japanese. Well, it is the equivalent of Nikkei. I can't remember the American. Wall Street. Wall Street. Yeah. What's the indicator? The Dow. The Dow. Dow Jones. Dow Jones. Uh, it also owns 50% of the Economist uh, magazine. It's an, it's an information services company. It buys and sells information, and education is an area where information can be bought uh, and sold. And it recently um, sold off uh, a financial data provider that it owned called Interact Interactive Data for, for $3.4 billion. And it's been using that money to acquire uh, more education companies. So it recently bought America's Choice, an education and information company, calls itself a leading provider of school information services. That was a bargain at $80 million. Um, it's also taken a 50% stake in India's largest education company called EduComp Solutions. Um, it's also recently uh, entered into a strategic partnership on Sistema Educacional Brasileiro, uh, one of the, the largest Brazilian uh, educational learning systems company. Uh, which it uh, bought for $326 million. So Pearson is expanding globally. It's also expanding its activities in terms of, as I said, vertical and horizontal integration. It offers pedagogical, curricular, and assessment services. So it, it provides you with the materials. It provides you with means of teaching them. It provides means of assessing them, and it also will provide the uh, administrative backup services um, for any educational venture. So some private higher education organizations, universities, now buy the entire package from Pearson. They buy the curriculum, they buy the pedagogy, the software, online materials, they buy the assessment technologies, and they buy the administrative systems for recruitment and management of students. 
etc. <coughs> but Pearson's also getting into other areas of education. It operates in higher education and uh, across the school sector. But recently it's been expanding into vocational education. The, uh, the purchase in India uh, was mainly oriented to vocational education. And it's bought uh, a, a British company, uh, also recently a company called uh, Melorio, um, which is a vocational training company, has 49 training centers around the UK. It bought that for $99 million. Melorio had only recently, in 2008, purchased two other companies, UK-based companies, Xenos Learning and Learning World Academies, uh, to add to its, uh, its stable of activities. So here we see again acquisitions and mergers and expansions and vertical and horizontal integration across sectors and across areas of, of activity, pedagogy, curriculum uh, and assessment. And, and Pearson uh, is active in, in every corner of the globe. Uh, there's not enough time to, to talk about its activities. Um, but some of its, its most recent developments have been in, in Vietnam, Colombia, South Africa, Malta, um, and numerous other places across Asia and Africa. But Pearson's not only interested in selling educational services, it's also interesting participating in education policy debates and education policy making. So through its Pearson Foundation, its, its um, uh, corporate social responsibility arm, um, it also runs a series of education conferences. So in this case, based in Singapore, it flew in um, senior education administrators from countries around the world um, to discuss key educational assessment and professional development practices that ensure students' success in mathematics and science education. And this goes back to the argument that A4E were making, that these companies can provide ways of improving your education system. They can provide uh, solutions to the problems of underperformance, underachievement, the development of uh, a high skills labor force. They can sell you those solutions. Um, so here, you can interpret this in two ways. It's a conference to discuss educational ideas, or it's a location for selling the possibility uh, of services uh, in new markets. I'll finish quite quickly. I, I want to get on to the, so the fourth, the third area, which is what I, I call um, selling students. Um, and this, this goes back to some of the examples mentioned already in terms of John Bauer, uh, etc., which is the, the actual buying and selling of the bricks and mortar of education, the institutions themselves. So these are not selling services or buying or selling uh, support or, or technical or curriculum development. Um, this is actually the, the, the hardware, the, the, the bricks and mortar, uh, which are being uh, bought and sold. Um, and again, this is, this is an issue of expansion and global reach. So Laureate Education, uh, one of the US's biggest private higher education companies, uh, when I wrote the slide, it owned 51 universities, it probably owns more now, because it, it buys them at frequent intervals. Um, has an income $2,560 million that year. Um, recently bought two Brazilian universities to add to its portfolio. Laureate is typical of many other education companies who are buying and selling educational institutions on the global marketplace. 2006 Laureate was bought by anybody want to take a guess? Yes. Yes. Cambridge. Not quite. It's KK, K, KKR again. It's, it's private equity. So KKR now have Kindercare and they also have Laureate uh, Education in, in their portfolio. And I want to tell you 
one last story. <laughs> this is one of the things I'm doing. I say a little bit about this tomorrow. One of the techniques I use both as a device but also as an analytic vehicle are, are, are networks. Um, this is a fairly simple one. Um, wait until you see the ones tomorrow. They are a lot more difficult. Um, this, this, is, this is based around um, uh, higher education in Southeast Asia and, and, and the Far East. Uh, and I'm not going to go all the way through it, but I, I want to draw your attention just to a, a couple of things. Um, and it raises an, another issue to throw into this, this mix. Um, university of Liverpool, which is a, a public university in the US, uh, in the UK, and the University of Nottingham, another public university, both um, highly respected, prestigious uh, public universities, now are both partners in ownership and running of offshore private universities. In the case of Nottingham, um, they have a university uh, partnership in uh, China with the Wanli Group, which is a state-funded educational company, um, Ningbo University, uh, and also in Malaysia, they, they uh, are co-owners of a university called UNIM, University of Nottingham in Malaysia, known as UNIM. They own 29% of, of UNIM, 51% is owned by a Malaysian company called Booster, whose main activities are uh, energy services. They, they sell electricity and gas power. Um, but they're also an in investor in UNIM. Boosted also owned um, a Chinese subsidiary called Easy Call International, um, which ran a, a, a college in, the, in China called Boosted College, um, which was also in partnership with Tianjin University of Commerce. Although in 2009, Boosted sold Easy Coal to the Raffles Education Group, uh, which owns, among others, it owns 10 universities across China and Southeast Asia, including the Oriental University City. So here again we have the buying and selling, the participation of education in diverse uh, companies. University of Liverpool um, are partners in uh, Xiangzhou, uh, Liverpool University, uh, based in China, um, and for their participation, uh, they pay something approaching £30 million pounds, um, to get involved in, in the setting up of, of this university with the local provincial government, in fact. That's for their <coughs> part. So here we have, a, in, in one sense, a public-public partnership between a public English university and a public local authority in China. Except, as it turns out, the $30 million was provided by Laureate Education. They lent mm. the money yeah, to Liverpool in order to invest in Xiangzhou. And if you look at the Liverpool University of Liverpool website <coughs> and uh, decide to enrol in one of their distance learning programs, you will see the uh, logo of Laureate. Laureate run the distance learning programs uh, of the University of Liverpool. So here we have a public university, two public universities, who are involved in financial partnerships with for-profit companies to run for-profit universities in offshore campuses. And there are more stories to be told about that. You'll see over here Kaplan, which is another major uh, US higher education company, which also owns the Washington Post, part of the Washington Post group, also very heavily involved in China, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, and also owns Ace Education, uh, which runs the Shanghai British College, um, which prepares Chinese students, students for the Northern uh, Consortium uh, of Universities in the UK. They teach them English and do preparatory work for them before they go off to the UK to do their higher education. What I'm trying to suggest here is the enormous complexity of interrelationships financial and otherwise, both between companies within the private sector, but increasingly between the private and what we used to call the public sector. I think in many ways, and I would make this argument more generally with other examples, both at national level, I think the notion of a public and a private sector, it, it, the division is now redundant. It's now meaningless. 
The idea of a public sector uh, carries no meaning at all. So what do, we, what do we conclude from all this? What do we take from all of this? Well, a whole range of issues. I'll, I'll just draw attention to a few. Um, one of the things that's happening in all of this is a process of um, policy uh, transfer, uh, policy colonization, and policy uh, convergence. Um, it's, it's beginning to create what Joel Spring calls a global uniformity around curriculum, pedagogy, uh, and testing, um, but also in terms of, of organizational forms and also in terms of language. We're talking about uh, English language <coughs> organizations here. So in, in, in the, the selling of materials, in the selling of policy ideas, there is a process of convergence between the West, East, North, and South, uh, along a whole variety uh, of dimensions. Even in the case, as I gave, the example of the Maldives, of UK-based companies writing the education policies um, of smaller states. So in this sense, we have to think about policy states themselves as changing in all of this, and being changed, or even being residualized. Um, Anne and Shell and Ari say the nation itself is being transformed by such mobilities. We have to begin to think, rethink the idea of the state, of the nation state. Um, new policy networks which cross over and through and above states are being created in which key uh, policy decisions uh, are being made. New policy communities are being created which I'll talk much more about um, tomorrow. Um, which is based in a new global architecture of, of, of political uh, relations, which involves national governments, they participate to some extent, multilateral organizations, but also transnational corporations who themselves are now influential policy players in a whole variety of senses that I've tried to indicate. In some cases it may mean that, that national governments are or may lose control of uh, some of their education policy leverage, but they may no longer have uh, direct control over their own education policy, their own institutions. And you think about some of the examples I've talked about, not only the writing of policy, but actually the ownership of public organizations which are owned and run by private companies. What happens if there is a clash of interests between the state and the company? What happens if issues of profitability come into play? Because we have to bear in mind, in a real market, in a real business sector, there are business failures and there are business difficulties. So what comes to be most important? Is it national policy priorities or profitability that wins out in terms of how uh, policy decisions are made? Who makes those decisions? Where are those decisions located. We're also getting, as I tried to indicate uh, latterly, um, uh, blurrings and, and hybridities. Uh, there are now new kinds of hybrid organizations that are emerging. Uh, universities, for-profit universities in offshore companies, uh, offshore campuses which are owned uh, by public um, uh, public sector institutions, as in the case of, of, of Liverpool and Malaysia. The participation in, in commercial uh, partnerships, um, the, the merging between uh, social public value um, priorities with those of, of profitability in um, a single institution. And so within all this, the boundaries between public and private, charity and profit, lending and donation, collapse. Those, those traditional binaries collapse. Um, and we now have forms of, of social capitalism, as sometimes called. Um, and, and business uh, policy problems now become business uh, opportunities. I've already said that, that this leads to uh, 
um, convergence, and, and I think one can argue that, that we're now beginning to see something that we can call global education policy. Um, Peck and Tickell talk about walking the fine line between transnationalism and localism in terms of how we make sense of the movement of policy. Um, I think I would want to come down on, on the transnational side of the line. <coughs> At least I would, I would like to wobble in that direction, keeping one foot on the line, perhaps. Um, we still need studies which explore the way that things are done um, in particular national localities. And through all of this, also, uh, we've now got the emergence of uh, uh, particular core concepts which, which organize practice based upon a generic model, and they are enterprise, the firm, and commodification. Everything becomes a firm. The charity, the public sector, university, uh, the philanthropy, the foundation, they all now modeled on the firm. They're all committed to the methods of enterprise, and they're all involved in the expanding processes of commodification modification of education services, commodification uh, of policy. But we still have to hang on to, and there's a, a, a longer story in all of this, in all of this, that we have to hang on to the notion of the state. Um, in, in, in the first wave of neoliberalism, there was this basic antagonism between uh, neoliberalism, business, and the state. The idea was to wear away the state. Uh, the, the triumph of business didn't quite work out that way. We're now in at least second, maybe the third iteration of neoliberalism, and the state is a key player in creating the conditions for neoliberal practices. The state is a market maker. The state is creating the flexibility, flexibilization, and the substitution practices which neoliberalism needs to flourish. Thank you very much. nation-state models, nation-state models of citizenship, right? Um, the idea that capital is immoral if if public, if private capital is invested for public issues that return to private, you know, good, right? So Although I didn't say that. Well, you didn't say that. You're going to say more of it. And, and yeah. I think the other the other idea is that knowledge is really a non-rivalrous good, that knowledge should not be commodified in some ways. But um, So I'm wondering if you can sort of compare ideas of liberalism that have been with us for quite a long time in the context of today's neoliberal ideas of, of market and the commodifiability of knowledge. Yeah. I guess you can address that in a number of ways. I mean, what, one way is, and, and sometimes the point that people make is that, you know, this is no different from what's been happening forever. Uh, internationalism, um, uh, the world economy um, has been with us for many centuries and there have been movements of various kinds. On the one hand, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I, I think what is different now is the scale and scope of activity, um, the, the extent of commodification, what counts as a good. Uh, it may have been in previous eras that policy knowledge was exported, but usually at the end of a gun rather than uh, at the end of a profit opportunity. I mean, clearly. Uh, the West was in the business of exporting policy ideas across the globe uh, in terms of its, its models of economy, uh, its models uh, of education. Um, so I think, we, I think it's both scale and scope, but, but really a, a very different uh, phenomenon. Um, I mean, education is interesting in that respect, um, in that uh, Western education was, was at, at, a, at a premium for some consumers um, it, from the 18th and 19th century on in places like Africa uh, and India. Um, there was a great demand for, for English education, um, either as a route into employment um, or as a route into revolution in some cases. The, the policy of the um, of the, the British government, in fact, was, was to minimize the opportunities for English language education in its colonies. Because it actually worked out that if you 
uh, taught the Greek philosophers in Africa and India that could lead to notions, radical ideas like democracy, um, but that really they didn't want the indigenous peoples to, to have their hands on. Uh, so, so England was, the British policy was, was very much to have vocational education, digging and farming and, and indigenous language education. The French were very different. The French were very keen to teach everybody in French and te teach them about French republicanism and indeed to make them part of the republic. So, sorry, I'm rambling. There, 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 is, there is a long history, but I think it's different in form and I think it's different in scale. And I think it's also different in terms of technology, in terms of the, the, the role of, of business. Uh, in all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it might have something to do with the sort of, you know, this discursive mode that you were talking about, because it's sort of been structured into the into the forms, into the into the commodified tradable forms here. Whereas the liberal knowledge, the knowledge of liberalism, yeah. including that which the British colonial office in the fifties tried to devolve in the late late, late years of colonialism, uh, was really an enlightenment. Had this idea of enlightenment and, and sort of you know non-utilitarian ideas of knowledge. This is yeah. Um, although I think I think there, there there were vestiges of, of utilitarianism. Oh sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah um, and in a sense, this is you can think about the period now as the period of second liberalism. In this case, talking about the other form of classical liberalism, the liberalism of the free economy in the nineteenth century, uh, of Ricardo and Smith. Um, that is, is the attempt now is to recreate that in the 21st century and go back to those basic principles of the market as a solution to all social problems. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, there's also a revisiting of, a, of an intellectual history uh, in a new social yeah. context. One thing firms tend to do is uh, want to monopolize opportunities. And one way they do that is to patent what they're doing or copyright. And I, don't know all the other terms. Um, so I'm wondering how much are they able to take policy ideas and say, well, you can only get that policy idea from so and so. You mentioned some firm is trying to sell New York the idea of the inspectorate. Yeah. Could you patent the idea of the inspectorate? And, well, there's a there's or a license it. There's a, there's a problem with that notion because uh, actually they didn't invent it in any case. <laughs> they, they ripped it out of the, uh, the English public education system and, and, and uh, commodified it and packaged it and resold it. But the companies do have, I mean, they, they talk about their services as products. So they do have the notion of products and they often have uh, specific names for their products. Uh, and this is true particularly in areas like school improvement. Um, so they will sell you a particular school improvement product, and that will be unique uh, to their company. So they, they, they do attempt to do that in, in a variety of ways. Um, they are operating in, in a classic uh, market form, and, and intellectual property rights, as was mentioned in relation to Gems and uh, Edison, are, are, are key issues in this. So yeah, that, 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 and that. Thank you, man. I don't know if you could say it's slightly tangential, but I think it's embedded with what you're talking about. Um, I was wondering if you could say something about issues of race and class um, as being kind of part of privatization of education. Um, like I'm thinking, for example, of the history of, Ed Ed uh, of Edison, where they got their start in Chester, Pennsylvania, and then were sold to the school district of Philadelphia, both of which serve um, a large portion of high poverty students and a large population, a majority population of students of color. Um, I'm also thinking about the latter part of your talk in which you uh, were talking about the for-profit colleges and universities. And I'm thinking specifically about how they have been aggressively recruiting students of color who qualify for Pell Grants, which is, again, fun of straight your government. Yeah, you're, you're right, it is an issue. I mean, it's very complex and it works out differently in different locations in, in different sectors. As I indicated with uh, A4E um, and uh, Pearson Science Center indicating this, and one of the areas of, of sales is this, this 
uh, selling solutions to entrenched social problems, and they would be particularly related to problems of the underperformance of uh, minoritized or um, uh, working class groups. So there is a, one of the areas of address is to uh, to, to social disadvantage, uh, and this is this is a market area that some of the companies in some of their activities are addressing. Um, and as I said at the beginning, this is partly related to the idea you know, that the state has failed to deliver, uh, to solve the problems of social advantage and, and the market uh, can do it better. Um, in some locations that, that, that works out further in, in, in strange ways, in both uh, um, generally in, 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 the, in the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, there has developed, there, there was already an existing state public system of higher education. Um, and in those locations, the, 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 the public universities are the high status universities. And for the most part, they're monopolized by the middle classes and the upper classes. The working class now want higher education in terms of getting into new labour markets, national ones and, and global ones. Um, and those countries have faced enormous demands for expansion of higher education, which they don't want to pay for. And one solution is to allow the private sector to, to deliver um, higher education to those sectors of the population. And that's certainly what's been happening in, in Brazil, which now has a huge, huge um, private higher education sector, some of which is very low cost, concomitantly, some of it is incredibly low quality. Um, and they're almost, almost entirely addressed to students who come from, from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, China have, have sought um, until recently to respond to the, the, the demands there for more higher education by allowing um, outside, as well as indigenous um, private providers, to so allow outside private providers. Um, and up until 2009, there were 500 offshore-owned higher education institutions um, in China. Um, the end of 2009, China decided not to uh, grant any more licenses. But it, it, it again provided uh, a solution for the state because um, the state could respond to the demand for higher education without having to pay for it. So it solved two problems. It, it, it mopped up the demand, um, and it mopped it up at, at relatively no cost at all. Um, again, there are problems, enormous problems about quality uh, in, in the private <coughs> offshore higher education system in China. And I, I, I read last year that in one provincial uh, city, um, that when the, the higher education provider issued its first um, uh, degrees and diplomas, uh, it actually led to student riots because the students were taking their diplomas to employers and saying, I've got a degree in engineering. And the employer was saying, oh, no, you haven't. We don't recognize that at all. And the students were, were sold the product on the basis that they had have an exchangeable qualification. So there is a whole set of very complex relations to, um, uh, to class and to colour uh, in all of this. We work out differently in different locations. And it's very interesting reverse in the sense that, that in, in places like China and, and, and Brazil, it's, it's the public universities that are the, the, the elite universities and the private ones which are the, the, the low status ones. Uh, would you care to comment a little bit on that? what the philosophy behind uh, uh, the philosophy of education uh, uh, is uh, uh, of these uh, businesses. Uh, what kind of education? Uh, you talked about, uh, for instance, the um, uh, Pearson Company. And it offers <coughs> pedagogical, curricular, and assessment services. Curricular service, what kind of knowledge? What kind of curriculum? Do we see here, therefore, a kind of further dehumanization of education, if you like? Uh, 
the 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 way that we're going to create or what kind of philosophy is behind it. What do they mean by education? Because I learn education, I learn to be uh, the cultivation of the minds and the souls. The idea of the mind and the idea of the soul. Now, do these companies try to promote such a kind of education or a different kind of education? If there is a market in the cultivation of the soul, they will... <laughs> but is there, is there, is there, to, the countries, to the countries that ask them to, to plan their education, do, do they emphasize that? Well, it, it's, this goes back to some of Michael's earlier work. It's, it's, it's the equivalent on a global and a virtual scale of, of textbook production. The, 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 the knowledge is, is tailored to the, the um, uh, relations of power um, that operates uh, in the marketplace or operates in relation to um, the consumer. Um, so Pearson provide textbook materials and software materials for any subject uh, that you can imagine, uh, virtually. And they employ textbook writers to... Um, uh, yeah, but the countries have also a concept of what is a citizen educational systems also try to develop a type of citizen, a human citizen. Yeah. Now, do these countries, what kind of citizen are they trying to help to create? A kind of entrepreneurial citizen? A kind of what? I, the only way I think you could describe it in a sense is that it's a global citizen because the, the, the Pearson can make its money by selling exactly the same product in every country. So they are keen to sell you a uniform uh, US or UK written and designed product uh, for your country. And that's, for the most part, what is, what is being bought. So there's, there's no attempt to address any kind of um, political agenda in relation to the, 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 the forms of knowledge, no explicit political agenda in the forms of knowledge. And just so other people can get it. I think Stephen, my question is probably related to Chris, and you may have touched on it already, but the issue of the value of these credentials, mm. particularly in higher ed, um, you know, we have proliferation, we have more colleges in this local area, mm. you know, ever before, yeah. and you don't even have to, you can do it in your pajamas or something, right? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. You do everything online, but what do you end up with and of what value is it? I mean, clearly people are going to these things and paying money to do so and in the U.S. using tax dollars to do so. But you go to a nursing school, but there are no nursing jobs for that level of nursing you allegedly got. So, I mean, is it... it is there a point at which people go, this is not really college, or this is not really whatever it is they, they said it was? Well, I think that there are two things that are going on. One is that it's a highly stratified market. Mm -hmm. So there are qualifications of, of different values, and they will get you into different labor markets. Mm -hmm. So there's now, there's now a global circuit of higher education institutions that, from which the, the major multinational companies recruit from Pricewaterhouse, Coopers, KPMG, Ernst & Young, etc. Recruit from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Stanford, um, NCAD in, in France. So there's that, there's that market at that, that level and that, that gives you access. Those qualifications gave you access to that market and then it, it steps down. There are, there are uh, lower levels of global markets, and then there are some institutions which will get you into national markets, and then some that will get you into local markets. So there's this incredible stratification in higher education. So having a higher education qualification means different things in different institutions. But alongside that, it's, it, our process is of qualification inflation. So in some markets now, what you could, a job you previously could have got with a, a high school diploma, you now need something more. And to some extent, some of these um, very, very low level universities or colleges are, are, are now providing an add on qualifi qualification to get into jobs that previously you could get with a much lower level. 
So those those two things happen together. Okay, let me just follow up on that because I, I, I understand and agree with what you're saying, but what at least I see people getting sold are credentials for jobs that they're not getting that job, period. It's not like come to college and get a job as an auto mechanic. That's not it. It's come to college and be a, par a legal paralegal. Hmm. You're not getting that. Hmm. Or, like I said, to be a nurse. So, so they're literally putting a vocational um, veneer on it, but you can't even get that particular job. Hmm. You know? Well, I, yeah, I think, I'm, I'm, but that's, I think, ratcheting up through the whole system that the, the match between your degree and the job that's available to you is, is becoming much more uh, uneven than it, than, it, than it was previously. Yeah. Um, so you, you need more and more to get less and less, yeah. in fact. Yeah, I think that's happening. And that, that was that was the basis for the, the, the riots in, in, in China. That people couldn't get the jobs that they wanted. In the in the UK we, we do have um, a system which um, limits the possibility of agree a degree awarding <coughs> power. Um, so you you need you need very special permission to, to award a degree, a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, whatever. Um, that's just been breached for the first time, virtually, um, whereby the government have recognised a private business school called BPP for the awarding of business degrees. Mm -hmm. Almost at the same moment that BPP were given degree awarding powers, they were bought by Apollo, um, which Apollo clearly sees this as a new market in which they I hate to do this, but uh, let me, you know, there are many, many questions. Uh, on Thursday, there was an open seminar uh, at 1220, and that's where I would hope that many of you could come and uh, spend more time with Stephen with specific questions. Uh, and a as a final story about the ways in which these things work and not for capital accumulation, but the Institute for Creation Science in Dallas <laughs> had just been given by the state of Texas the ability to certify science teachers in the entire state of um, Texas. So this works uh, in terms of conversion over religious capital as well as other kinds of capital. And on that note, to make you feel nauseous, <laughs> <laughs>